All right, welcome today, guys. I am super excited to have Sachin Patel. Sachin is the guardian of truth and warrior of light. His superpower is taking complex ideas and distilling them down to their essence with easy to understand analogies. Sachin uses this gift to help transform the lives of thousands of people around the world through his organization, the Living Proof Institute. Sachin founded the Living Proof Institute as part of his own personal transformation. When he couldn't find answers through conventional medicine, he began to explore functional and lifestyle medicine, and it dramatically changed his life. Sachin is most notably a father, a husband, a philanthropist, a functional medicine practice success coach, international speaker, and author. His philosophy is that the doctor of the future is the patient. And he's actively doing whatever it takes to keep people out of the medical system and empower them through education, self-care, and remapping their mindset. Sachin, how are you, sir? I am extremely well. Thank you for having me, Ben. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know you're a busy guy who's on a massive mission to change the world of healthcare as we know it. And it's very exciting for me to play what you know small role I can in it. Um, before we get any further, I want to um, guide everyone listening. If you only have a couple minutes to listen to this, the most value that I think we can provide is something that Sachin's already created. And what I want you to do is go to 30in30.org. Um, I'm going to provide the link just down below. Go ahead and click on the link, sign up for it. I promise you it's going to be so much value for you. And, and Sachin, why don't you go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the impetus behind the 30 and 30 and what people can expect from it. Sure. So first things first, the reason we created this program was because we honestly understood the problem at hand. And, and the current healthcare crisis is so big that it's not going to be any one practice or any one clinician that's going to fix a problem. In fact, if every single person who was a medical doctor or a, a clinician became a functional medicine practitioner, we still wouldn't have enough people to solve the problem. So to really understand the magnitude of what the issue is required a solution that involved the patient. And even before somebody becomes a patient, the real question they should be asking is, am I doing everything that I can do to stay as healthy as possible? Imagine yourself as a patient and when I see a patient, I look at them as a wilting plant. And if a plant is wilting, I'm going to make sure that the owner of that plant is doing the basics. Is the plant getting enough sunlight, enough water? Is there enough soil? Is the pot big enough? What is the temperature? Before I start doing any fancy or expensive procedures on the plant, I need to know that it's getting what it needs. So a lot of people, and this is through working with thousands of patients, we've discovered that most people aren't doing the basics. And they're not doing the basics because what they're looking for is a diagnosis. And that diagnosis is actually a result of them not doing the basics. So we created a 30-day program so that we could give out our best information, things that patients can action for themselves, which we would tell them anyways if they came into our practice. And it saves them a lot of time and money and energy, but it also saves us having to save the world, right? If people can save themselves, then we can start implementing immediate, they can start implementing an immediate solution to their problem. And if they still don't feel better after implementing these 30 things, then they can seek the help of a practitioner and whatever help they get from that practitioner is going to be the icing on the cake that gets them well again. But if somebody isn't doing the fundamentals and then layering on top of that expensive treatments, interventions, lab testing, and supplements, they're never going to get better. In fact, they'll probably get worse because they're trying to build a house on sand and they'll be bitter because their investment will never pay a dividend. So because we care about getting people results, we want to know that they're doing their part so that we as clinicians can get outstanding outcomes with them as well. So that's, that's why we put it together. And there's 30 things in there that you're probably already doing, but we're just going to teach you how to do them a little bit differently or a little bit better and, and really capitalize on something called a compound effect. These are things, like you said, these are things that most people are already doing but maybe have not realized the implications on their health. Because typically when people start to search out functional medicine practitioners or even go to their doctor because they're expressing symptoms of dis-ease, 
you know, they're looking for something and they're already far down the path. But these are lifestyle, nutrition, health factors that people can start to implement right away that are going to make a profound difference in their health, longevity, absence of disease, all of that stuff that we're talking about that may even keep them from even stepping foot in the doctor's office or having to go through with potentially expensive lab testing and things like that. And just so you guys understand, I mean, these are things like expressing gratitude, uh, sleep, Pooping. Well, you know, what's healthy poop? I mean, this is important to understand. Healthy communication, um, reducing your electromagnetic frequency exposure, expressing forgiveness. You know, there's so many components of our daily life that contribute to our stressors. And we've talked about how stress contributes to disease and gut health and brain inflammation and all of this stuff. So when you're taking the time to improve your you know, behavioral components and your habits revolving around your nutrition, sleep, lifestyle, all of those things that we're constantly talking about, it's obviously going to reflect on your, in your overall health. And so helping you understand that these are components that what, what Sachin has done is giving you this extremely valuable guide that by, just like I said, by simply uh, applying, you can, really create kind of so much more health than than what you've been experiencing before. Um, Sachin, what have you seen from your patients or even from people that have implemented the 30 and 30? What have you been hearing about people's response to that? You know, I had a lady, this is my favorite response that I've gotten so far. We get lots of positive feedback, but by far my most memorable one was a 92-year-old female and she's uh, she's just been following every post, reading every post, and pretty much responding to every post. So it's really cute to, to see a 92-year-old 90, woman uh, sending me emails. And just a couple of weeks ago, she actually wrote me a handwritten letter, and she must have gotten our address, and she literally sent me a $25 check in the mail. She said that this information is so valuable, and it's helped me so much already just you know, being a couple of weeks into it that I felt compelled to pay you in some way. And of course, that money, we, I cashed the check, but I donated that money because I wanted to, you know, let that energy flow because one of the things we talk about in, in the 30 day program is being a good receiver, right. And, yeah. and allowing that flow of energy to continue. So I did cash the check and I donated to a charity that I contribute to, but that was probably my most favorite thing is just seeing the expression of gratitude from people and, and knowing that they appreciate the work that's being done. And, and we get, I probably get five or six emails every week from people saying how much it's impacted them and, how much they were overlooking some of these fundamental things. And a lot of people who are in this list of, of people who are going through the program have seen many, many practitioners and nobody's really talked about the fundamentals because everyone wants to sell you their highest level package, right? They want to sell you the Cadillac when you don't even have a driver's license to drive it. So our goal with this, again, just understanding the millions of people that need help is helping people understand that they're in charge. They are the doctor of the future. And nobody can take care of themselves better than they can take care of themselves. And that doesn't mean that they'll, ne- they'll never need the doctor. But what it does mean is that they'll, they'll be a much better patient when they do see the doctor because they'll be sleeping. They'll be, you know, their nervous system will be dialed in. They're not going to be anxious. They're going to be uh, getting the appropriate amount of sunlight and expressing gratitude and going to the bathroom in the right, you know, squatting position as opposed to the sitting position. So these things make a huge difference. And, you know, people pay me a lot of money to, to you know, to come into our office and, if we, can, if we can avoid having that dialogue because people are already doing these things, then they get a lot more value out of the services that we're actually providing because we know they've got the foundation uh, in place. So, you know, just a lot of gratitude coming back uh, from the program. And we recognize, and the goal of this is to keep people out of our office and also to keep their family out of our office. You know, most practices are, are centered around, and I, I don't want to make generalizations, but a lot of practices are centered around, okay, I've got this sick person, now how do I get their husband in or how do we get their children in whereas our motto is how do we keep your family out of our office so if we can give you lifestyle interventions that you can start applying and your family can start applying then we can keep your whole family healthy and that's really what you know living proof is after is to make everyone their own best practitioner and keep them out of the medical system so that we can create something bigger and beautiful instead of bigger hospitals and and bigger clinics we can create you know stuff that actually serves people um, and you know celebrates the human experience instead of repairs the human experience. Yeah, that's great. And and like I said, I mean, you know, in, in when so many models are based around 
we have all the answers and it's all about testing, getting objective data, and then diagnosing and treating with protocols, but, but completely losing sight of, of everything else that goes into overall health. And so you've given such, such valuable resources here, um, like I said, that I think people can implement and keep themselves even from necessarily having to do the testing in the first place, um, at least being a huge stepping stone for people that, uh, you know, earlier on in my career, I would have felt like, why would I be giving away all this information? This is such valuable stuff that people should be paying me for this. And, and now you're going ahead and, and giving it away. For, so for all those people that are looking for helpful resources in a time when there's so much contradictory information and conflicting information, um, you know, on the internet, you've got a great resource here. And it's not necessarily something that you need to implement 30 days in a row. But what you should do is save it all to your inbox and go through and, and, and identify the ones that are tangible for you to start to implement right away today uh, and go with, you know, go with it is go out, take your shirt off, get more sunlight, start eating more whole food, set the timer, you know, the clock back by 30 minutes, make sure you're eliminating all of the light in your bedroom, start drinking more clean water. It's like so seemingly simple stuff, but the stuff that all of us neglect because we're busy, we're stressed, we have families and, and all of this stuff, but you know, it's, we're just constantly talking about it. Um, Sachin, could you talk to me a little bit more, um, talk to us a little bit more about your role in the functional medicine community? What, what, ex what does functional medicine mean to you and, and how do you use it in your practice? Sure. So really what we do is something called functional and lifestyle medicine. And I want to make that very clear because in my opinion, lifestyle is about 80% of the solution. And then the other 20% comes from the lab testing and really uncovering some of the root causes. So anytime you get any lab testing done, no matter how simple or advanced the testing is, that lab test is a result. That's why we call it a lab result. And so we want to know what is it a result of? Is it a result of poor lifestyle choices or is it a result of circumstance? Is it a result of environment? Is it a result of emotions? Because if we don't change the causative factor, we're never going to change the result. And so our, our practice is really focused on uh, making sure that people are doing the fundamentals, the things that they can do, the things that they're responsible for. And then we dig a little bit deeper once we do that to find out what actually is interfering. So these are what we call blind spots, right? We don't want to have people pay us uh, to fix their, their, the most obvious things they're doing incorrectly. What people pay us to do is find the blind spots that they, that they can't look in the mirror and see, that they can't look around their home and necessarily find. So we go down to a cellular level. So we look at six pillars when we're working with a patient. And really it starts with a, a thorough intake because if you go back to any medical system, any medical paradigm is gonna tell you that the patient is gonna tell you what's wrong with them if you just listen. So we start with a 46 page intake form. And in the in intake form, we go through the dental history, their medical history, their social history, their dietary history, through their stressors that they've been through in their life, through you know the health of, of their, um, of their mother when they were, when they were being, um, when they were given birth and all these other factors that are often overlooked, or you'd have to see 10 different specialists to get, you know, somebody to dive deep into these areas. So from there we have, you know, an extensive dialogue with the patient to really figure out where their health uh, turned for the worse and why they're here and what are going to be the perpetuating factors in their illness. Sometimes we find it's relationships that are a problem. Sometimes we find it's poor subconscious programming. Sometimes we find it's their job that's killing them or a lack of purpose or a lack of appreciation. So we look at them from a multifaceted perspective. We're not just going to look at them and say, hey, your one marker here is off. Let's give you a pill or a supplement and fix that. And that's going to fix everything because we don't live in one dimension. And, and so disease doesn't occur in one dimension. So we try to take a multidimensional, multifaceted approach to their health. And we're kind of a no BS type of uh, approach. So if, if their husband's a problem, we're going to tell them. If their job's a problem, we're going to tell them. People don't pay us to tell them what they want to hear. They pay us to tell them the truth. So we've had many cases and many instances where the divorce was the answer, where quitting their job was the answer, where moving because they had mold issues was the problem. You know, I had one girl who was extremely, extremely sick. And I told her, I said, I'm not going to take your case. My practice isn't going to take your case unless you move because she had this like coating of mold all over her basement and she lived in her basement and her dad was actually the owner of the home. And so she was so afraid of her dad having to mitigate this mold issue and the financial consequences of it. 
And when we finally, when she finally did get a mold inspector to come in, they realized the house actually had to be condemned because it was, it was in, uninhabitable. So I didn't want to waste her money with us trying to fix a problem that was created by her home. And when she fixed that home issue, she actually moved out of the home. Her health completely transformed. And now she's a completely functioning, normal human being, earning an income again. She was disabled to the point where she couldn't work. So we don't candy coat or sugar coat anything. And we take a multidimensional approach. And, and so we have different experts that work in our practice and different people that we've established relationships and connections, connections with. So it's not just functional lab testing and nutrition. That's one, you know, one or two dimensions. But we have hypnotherapists on our staff so that we can reprogram people's subconscious brains. We have NLP coaches so we can change the way people think and the way they dialogue uh, with themselves. We have uh, people that can help them with grocery shopping and, and teach them how to reestablish a relationship with food. We have breathing coaches so they can reestablish their breath. And so there's lots of different ways that we can get people healthy. And, and so we've created what we think is a I don't want to say complete solution because we're constantly growing and adding members to our team, but we've tried to create the most complete and comprehensive solution out there uh, by taking a multifaceted, multidimensional approach to somebody's health. And, and what we've realized is that this is why people stay sick because you're essentially trying to palliate their worst life. You're trying to make their worst life more comfortable for them. And of course they're going to stay sick because sickness is your body's way of telling you, you need to change something. And if you're not willing to change something, then taking pills or taking medications, you know, is not really going to be the answer for you. Yeah. That's often one of the hardest things as a practitioner is identifying problems, quote unquote problems with people and having to tell them, you know, problems beyond this is beyond just diet and exercise. These are, these are deep seated problems, emotional problems, lifestyle issues, communication issues that need to be addressed if you're going to heal. And, and you know, the common, the common issues for people are what? They're low energy, poor sleep, lack of libido, um, issues with weight loss, you know, unable to, inability to lose weight, uh, poor cognitive function. And, and so it often goes so far beyond just the, the diet and the exercise, all of the things that you're alluding to and getting really real with someone and saying, look, you know, here's what we're identifying as being an issue that you need to start to change if you are serious about getting better. And one of the, I know one of the hardest things for people is actually accepting that they have problems beyond the stuff that they're putting in their mouth and the fact that they're working too, too long and watching too much TV at night. Yeah. One thing I'll say, you know, when it comes to healthy nutrition, because everyone that comes to see us is eating healthy. You know, nobody's coming straight from McDonald's into our waiting room. They're, they're conscious, they're healthy, they've seen multiple practitioners, naturopaths, even sometimes uh, multiple functional medicine practitioners. And I think what makes us different is that honesty, that brutal honesty, is which, which is what they need to hear. And people have kind of been dancing around it. And, and there's not a lot of people that are going to tell you what you need to hear because they're afraid of, you know, what those consequences might be. So one of the things that we've learned is when it comes to diet, an important question to ask people is not just what you're eating, because it's obvious. I mean, eat whole foods, eat healthy foods, don't eat anything processed. And then you can adjust the macros as you see fit uh, based on what that person's goals are. But the question that I have for them is why are you eating? So are you eating healthy so that you can then go back to a job that you hate? So what process am I fueling, right? It's like being, it's being like a gas, gas uh, station attendant and then filling a premium fuel in somebody's car and then watching them drive off in the wrong direction. They're never going to get where they want to go, right? And they're always going to be miserable because they're going to be searching for that nirvana that they're looking for. And it's not in that direction. It's in the other direction they need to go in. So we're not interested in palliating people as they live out their worst life. We're interested in helping people live out the best life possible. And so we, we kind of think of ourselves as a personal development a studio as well. So it's not just about, you know, changing the mechanics and changing the car. It's about making you a better driver and then giving you a roadmap to get somewhere where you actually want to end up. That's great. It's nice to hear that, you know, your practice is so deeply rooted in that. And one of the things that really resonated for me as I was going through your 30 and 30, because I've taken a couple of courses with, with you from you in terms of, I, I took a neurotransmitter course 
you know, maybe uh, six months ago with you and I started going through the 30 and 30. And of course, a lot, it's a lot of stuff that I, I know, but may not necessarily be practicing. And one of the things that resonated with me at the time was my, um, what is it, the, the five love languages mm-hmm. and my communication style. And it resonated for me because my communication style is one of affirmation, is is I'm not necessarily a touchy-feely person. I don't need a lot of, of sort of physical um, attention, if you will, but I really thrive off of uh, my, you know, my, uh, my wife saying that she's proud of me for something or that she can tell how much effort I put into something or I did a very good job, you know, and showing her appreciation in that way versus for her, she's more of a, a physical person. She needs to be shown that love and, and doesn't need to, but, but that's where it resonates with her. And the value of identifying that communication style within a relationship as it pertains to our stress and our quality of life. I was talking to a practitioner last week who I interviewed, Dan Kalish, and he was talking about how many adrenal lab tests he's run through his career, tens of thousands of labs tests. And he says every single time he knows the quality of the adrenal health from the quality of the patient's relationship with their significant other. Absolutely. And, and so it's so powerful to, to identify with those things and then implement them and, and say, look, is this, is this something that's serving me well or is this something that's contributing to my ill health? Absolutely. You know, this is something we are, we are creatures that require proper communication, proper communities, and we need to have a sense of belonging and appreciation. And, you know, one of the things that we have to realize is different people have different languages. And a lot of times these languages are based on the things that we didn't get growing up. So it's our inner child looking for that love language. And so my love language is physical touch and words of affirmation. So my parents are not very touchy feely. We're not a very huggy, you know, kissy type of family. I've never seen my parents kiss in my entire life. And, uh, and they've never said outright said to me or my brother that we're proud of you. Mm-hmm. And so these are the things that I crave. Like, so I, I love when my wife is touchy and feely with me and gives me a hug and says, wow, I love just like you, like, wow, I love how hard you're working and I'm proud of you. Those are the things that get me going. And my wife's love language is, is not those things. Her love language is quality time. And her other love language is acts of service. So taking out the trash, right? You know, vacuuming, making sure that the dishes are put away, yes. the laundry is folded. That's her love language. Now, when she does those things for me, she, ex- she not anymore, but she expects me to appreciate those things and value those things, but I never do because those, were not, those are not my love languages. And so when, she, when I come home from work after a long day of work, after changing all these lives, right, if you right. know, and she's like, take the trash out. I'm like, shit, man, can you just give me like a positive like affirmation and say you're proud of me? Because that will get me to take the trash out on my own. And so with her, she's not, I'm touchy feely. She's not. So for a long time, there was, there was this, not a, not a problem in our marriage, but it was something because you start questioning yourself. Why is it, why isn't this person reciprocating, you know, this behavior and that can stress you out because then you get stuck in your head thinking there's something wrong with you. But her parents were very touchy feely. So that's not an area where she has any inadequacy, right? She's, she's had that her entire life. So her inner child was supported with those things uh, and maybe too much of those things, um, you know, based on, based on my understanding. So it's that inner child that's screaming out. And, and that brings me to something that's very important, which is our subconscious uh, programming. And our subconscious programming really forms between the age of zero and seven, And this is very important to understand for anyone who's watching this. I know you have a lot of moms that are watching this with young families. Between the age of zero and seven, your brain is basically a sponge. So even though a child cannot uh, speak, because that requires a neurological development uh, of coordinating the brain with the mouth and the jaw and the tongue, that's why a child takes forever to be able to express themselves. But their understanding is pretty much immediate, right? A child understands the world they're being brought up in before they're even born. So that starts in the womb because they can listen to music, they can respond to the father's and mother's voice. And so their understanding of the world is basically happening the 
you know, shortly after they're conceived when the brain and nervous system starts developing. So those, those years are extremely influential in a child's life. And so going back to that inner child can be very critical in the healing process. For some people, the only time they got attention from their parents was when they were sick. That was the most attention that they got from their parents was when they were unwell or when they were sick. So as an adult, if, that, if their attention needs aren't being met, but what's the subconscious program going to, going to realize? It's going to realize that, hey, if I get sick or if I stay unwell, then I'm going to get attention. I'm going to get help. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get people you know, asking me you know, what, what I need and what, what needs to be done. So that's one of the reasons some people stay sick for, for many, many years. And they just don't realize that it's their subconscious programming that's craving this attention. And they feel they've been programmed to think that that's the only way they're going to get it. But if you start dialing in your love languages, if you start becoming a better human being yourself and develop these relationships that we all have that are important to us, then it's amazing how much of the stress and illness starts to go away. That's incredible. And I, man, for me, it's so awesome connecting with practitioners like you and selfishly, it's, it's just, you know, it's just ways I keep helping identify more things that, you know, personally, I, I've been working through over the years and personal health issues and stuff like that. So selfishly, it's great, but I know that the message is, is so powerful to everyone listening. Sachin, what, so what is a way, what's a resource for people to start to identify those subconscious, subconscious thought patterns that may be holding them back in their health journey? Well, if you're looking for the fastest way, which is probably what your audience is looking for, is, is hypnosis. So hypnosis is not what you think where your eyes start spiraling and you start doing crazy things. I mean, there's, there's actually a lot of power behind this. So essentially, you're put into a trance-like state. And in this trance-like state, your brain is operating at a certain frequency, almost like that childlike, sponge-like frequency, where new thoughts, new ideas uh, can be then implanted. And that is the way to rewrite that operating system. So that's the fastest way to do it. You want to find a hypnotherapist that you trust, someone that is aligned with your core values and somebody who, you know, uh, who is experienced and obviously uh, somebody who has a good intention. And if you can do that, that's the fastest way uh, to reprogram the subconscious. We all have subconscious issues. Now, one way to know what your subconscious issues are is to look at your parents and your parents essentially programmed you. So Whatever was going on in your life between the age of zero and seven, which is what was really happening in your parents' life between the eight, your age of zero and seven, that's probably where your subconscious programming comes from. So for me, my parents were immigrants. Money was a big issue. So they have a money scarcity mindset. That's one thing, right? Education was heavily reinforced above happiness, right? Education above happiness because that's what they felt they needed. That's their, that was their golden ticket to come to Canada, um, was to have a strong foundation in education. And so their way of lowing, showing love, what was reinforced, what was coveted between the age of zero and seven for me was those things. And so talking to your parents and understanding what was going on in their lives and in your lives and in, in the environment they were growing up in, that's what is going to be a, a big clue into what your subconscious programming is like. And, it, you know, the subconscious pro mind is a million times more powerful than the conscious mind. So if you're struggling with getting your head around something or if there's an area in your life where you feel challenged and you haven't been able to overcome it or you feel fear or anxiety around it, it's probably a, more of a subconscious issue than anything else. So those are some good places uh, for you to start. You have a little, a little one, right? You got a little yep. boy? Could you share a little bit about, if you don't mind, share a little bit about how you maintain a healthy family balance? Um, you know, I, I don't know. How old's your son? He's, uh, he's almost seven. He'll be seven in August. Okay. And, and what have you found that's surprisingly easy and surprisingly difficult maybe in terms of maintaining that healthy balance with, I mean, you know how it is with school, with birthday parties, with healthy food, um, with potentially, I, I know earlier on when my daughter, my oldest daughter was younger, I was overly stressed out and dogmatic about her eating clean food, staying gluten-free, you know, just obnoxiously so. 
and I've obviously eased the reins, but we really try and maintain a very healthy balance in our house. I don't know if there's certain tips that you could, you know, potentially share for our listeners towards that sentiment. Sure. So the most important language is not the words that we say, but it's the actions that we take. So no matter what language somebody speaks, whether it's English, Cantonese, you know, Hindi, whatever it is, the universal language is action. So if, if I see you doing something, then I'm going to want to do it as a child, especially. And so we set the example. We can never tell our children to do something that we ourselves are not doing. So there's a great story, a great parable from Gandhi. And there was a mother who had a child who was eating lots and lots of sugar. And she brought him to see Gandhi to have Gandhi say to him, hey, you know, cut out the sugar. It's not good for you. So they travel three days to go see him. And Gandhi said, uh, you know, the, the mom said to Gandhi, he's eating so much sugar. It's not good for his teeth. Is, you know, it's not good for his health. And Gandhi said, come back in two weeks. And so she came back in two weeks and Gandhi just simply turned to the boy and said, I want you to stop eating sugar. The boy said, okay. The mom looked at him and said, why didn't you just say that two weeks ago? We had to go all the way back and then come back to come see you. And now we've got to all the, go all the way back home. And he said, two weeks, two weeks ago, I was eating sugar. So we can never give people advice that we ourselves are not following, right? That's one thing. And that's why our office is called Living Proof, because you're never going to have me tell you to do something that I myself am not doing. So leading by example is very, very critical. And then once your children become a certain age, then keep in mind that they're going to have to make conscious choices and you want the choices that they make to be their choices. So from a very young age, my son loves superheroes, right? So he loves Iron Man and, and uh, the Avengers. And, you know, one of the things that we did from the very beginning is we set an example for him and, and told him, listen, the diet that these guys eat to maintain the strength that they have and to be superheroes is not junk food. It's healthy, nutritious food. And whenever he accomplishes a goal, we actually don't acknowledge the goal. We acknowledge the effort that went into that goal. So if he gets a good mark on a quiz or a test, then we don't congratulate him on that, on that one single effort. We congratulate him on, you know, hey, Devin, it's all that sleep you're getting. It's all the healthy food that you're eating. It's all the exercise that you're doing. So that reinforces that behavior. And he starts to realize that the reason he produced this result was because of all that effort that he was putting in. So now I feel no two ways about leaving him in a room and getting him to make the healthy decision. And so it's taken the stress off of my plate. And we tell him, listen, this is your body, right? You're not going to see me eating this stuff because it goes into my body. And my job is to keep you healthy and to, and to lead by example. And so if you want to eat this food, it's totally up to you. And guess what? 99 times out of 100, he makes the right choice. So we have to kind of trust because a lot of times what happens is parents become, they have this iron fist around their kids. And when their kids go off to college or when they're at their friend's place for a party or something, they go off the deep end, right? right? Because they don't, they're trying to defy their parents in a certain way. Whereas my parenting style is a little bit different. They may be controversial in some cases, but my parenting style is that this is their body. It's their journey. It's my job to guide the journey, but not to necessarily uh, you know, change the journey for them. And sometimes people need to learn the hard way, right? Sometimes they need to have that stomach ache after eating the junk so that they don't do it again. If you constantly try to avoid it, then what's going to happen is they're going to want it more and more and more. And, you know, unfortunately that's what ends up happening for a lot of parents. And then it creates a lot of turmoil and stress and, and anxiety because then when your kid isn't around, you're always kind of questioning what choices they're going to make. That's, that's powerful stuff. And I, I, I love and appreciate that the, uh, the onus is on us to, to lead by example. And I think that's, that's really important for people to acknowledge. And I know we all could be better, but is, is we're setting, you know, the example for our children to, to, to grow up, to, to continue to make good decisions for themselves. Um, if you're okay, I want to get kind of a little bit more personal on, and just ask you a couple questions. And the first one is uh, what are some, one or two failures that you've experienced that have helped set you up for success? Hmm. Failures. That's a good one. Um, I would say, you know, I guess some of the things that I've learned over time is that there is no such thing as failure as long as you learn uh, from it and, you know, and you grow from it. So I know that sounds really cliche, but you know, my, whenever I do something, it's with an, it's a, it's with a very specific intention. And I learned that when you, 
when you have the right intention going into something, it, it always just generally tends to work out. The biggest turning point and shifting point in my life was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I don't know if it was a failure on my part, but maybe a failure in not recognizing that uh, something was not working out the way it's supposed to. So I was working for a clinic and for about a year, they didn't pay me or they'd paid me a fraction of what they actually owed me. And I was in a really tough position because I had to earn some income. I just bought a house. I just, uh, you know, I just had a son at that point and the company owed me about $60,000. And so the thing I failed to recognize at that time was that I need to take immediate action. And so when I did, it was like, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, but I wish I had done it sooner. So sometimes we don't, I don't think, look at things like, I don't look at things as failures. I look at things as timing. So sometimes it's just bad timing for us to do certain things. And, uh, and there's a good time to do certain things. And there's a time when we do things out of fear and there's a time where we do things out of trust. So I had to, I had to kind of tap into that side of myself and do something out of trust and just kind of walk off the job. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it allowed me to step into the role that I have now and empower, you know, th literally thousands of people through this process. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, it's, it's a, that's a tough question, man. You, you really put me on the spot with that one. I, I don't know <laughs> if there's, if, some, if there's something that I would consider a really big failure in my life because I've learned from all these experiences, yeah. they've grown me, they've molded me. Uh, and I look back at them and I look at them as amazing things that have happened to me. I mean, if this company was paying me the way they were supposed to, I might still be working there. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I not realize this potential that I have. Yeah, no, you answered it beautifully. And I think that uh, for those of us that are entrepreneurial, you know, we experience multiple quote unquote failures and, you know, it's something that we really embrace and that helps propel us to the next level. Um, and so it's not something that you necessarily see as a failure per se, but it's something to say, okay, okay, cool. I, you know, I went for it, lesson learned. And now I'm going to, you know, either move direction or I'm going to take the next step forward or I'm going to take a step back and sidestep. And, and so I, those are absolutely crucial components of, of personal and professional growth. Um, so there's, there's one thing that, I, that I'll say, and this mantra might help people that are, that are watching this is you can look at life and circumstance in one of two ways. You can look at, you can look at life as if it's happening to you or you can look at it as if it's happening for you. And when I, when I had that mental shift that everything that's happening in my life is happening for me, then it was never, a failure is just basically a nudge to move in a different direction, mm -hmm. right? And what we, what we define as failure um, you know, differs from person to person. To me, failure isn't an event. Failure is not living out your dream and not living out your passion. And so these little micro failures that we have along the way are little nudges that are moving you uh, you know, in, in the right direction. If you look at it as if things are happening to you, then you're always kind of in this victim mindset. Why did this happen to me? Instead, if you look at things happening for you, then you're wondering, okay, this is happening for me. What can I do with this information and knowledge that I've gained from this? So what is some of the best advice you've ever received? Hmm. Well, I just gave some really good advice. That about is pretty good advice. Things happening for you versus to you. And, and I think, you know, two of the best things my parents taught me, and, and I'll share their lessons. I mean, they were super hardworking people. They, uh, you know, we grew up in kind of a, a middle class family. My brother's a physician. I'm a physician. And so we, we both somehow succeeded. We overcame, you know, all of the odds, if you will, uh, to be where we are right now. And the two things that my parents told me that still resonate with me, and these are my takeaways, you know, from a lifetime of uh, knowledge they've shared with me. My dad said, whatever you do, be the best. So that's what I strive to do is, is be the best in whatever it is I'm tr trying to do. So even if it's shaving my beard, I try to be the best. If it's, you know, being a good functional medicine practitioner or a coach, I try to do the best. I don't, I don't really half-ass anything. So I'm kind of an all or none kind of guy. And so, you know, if I'm going to do something, it's going to be amazing or I'm not going to do it at all. And that's why I don't, I, that's why I don't golf because I'm not a good golfer. So I'm not even going to try to be that. I'm going to, if I'm going to do something, I want to be the best at it. The other thing my mom taught me is to never be cheap about your food. So, you know, and, and we honor our parents by taking care of our bodies. That's one thing that uh, I'll impart on you. If you care about your mom, then take care of the very thing that she built for you, which is your body and honor it and cherish it and put the right nutrition into it. So growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, but my parents always had healthy food 
and 99 times out of 100 homemade food on the table. In fact, we couldn't afford to eat out, right? This is when, you know, uh, in, in their, again, this is their mental mindset that, hey, I can make that at home and it'll be cheaper than paying somebody else to do it. So that was one of our saving graces is that we never ate out as children growing up. We viewed it as a treat, whereas now I would view eating out as a punishment if you think about it. Um, yeah, one of the, I can appreciate that. One of the mantras I, I definitely try and live by is if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no, right? If, if you're anywhere in between and your gut is telling you otherwise, then, then back away or run away from that, that, you know, potential opportunity because it's probably not going to be the right thing for you and keep learning the hard way, but I think, uh, still moving in the right direction. And, um, I'm just going to ask you, uh, one or two more and we'll wrap it up here. And, um, what are three people or resources or two or three people or resources that you've uh, learned from or been following closely in this past year or two? So a couple of people, I mean, Charles is someone who I've really gotten to know well over the last uh, year and a half or so. And I think he's, you know, a major innovator in the, in the health and wellness space and, and probably under recognized because of, you know, he's working a lot with trainers, but the stuff that he says really applies, you know, well beyond uh, that scope. So I would say Charles is somebody who I really admire and I just admire, admire his work ethic, you know, so, you know, I admire someone who's been doing this for many, many years, who's been innovating for many, many years and somebody who just puts out good work and stand and a man of his word. That's another thing that I, I really admire about him. Another person I admire is, you know, I admire James Maskell. I don't know if you know who he is, but James, James is an innovator in the healthcare space and he's somebody that has, who's not a practitioner, but sees an amazing, amazing, beautiful future for healthcare. And he's going, he's putting all of his eggs into that basket and trying to solve a major health crisis that we have, you know, that we're in, and there's a bigger one coming. So I really admire his work and his effort. And, you know, I see how much he travels and, and uh, gets all over, you know, travels all over the world to try to solve this crisis. So I, I really admire his work effort uh, as well. And, and it's somebody that, you know, you would think that a doctor would be solving this problem right? Uh, a medical problem. But for him to step into that role, I think is, is quite admirable for me. So I agree with you 100%. Um, Charles has been a chart. So, so we're referring to Charles Poliquin and people can find more about Charles Poliquin at strengthsensei.com. And then, uh, and then James, is he evolution of medicine.com? I think oh, it's no. evomed.com. Evomed. Dot com, so I'll provide a link. But Charles has been a big influence on me throughout my career. And, and he's just, a, he's one of those guys, uh, he's one of those practitioners who has really led by example and, and has, um, has been really preaching these components of health and functional medicine far, be, far before we had any research or data to, to back it up. And mm -hmm. And so um, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought him up. Uh, with that said, Sachin, where can people find out more about you? And could you talk just for a second about the your mission to help other practitioners with um, you know implementing all of the things that, that that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So when I if I go back to that job where I was working and, and uh, I wasn't getting paid, uh, when I walked off that job, I I never wanted to be in a position like that ever again. And I never wanted to put anyone else in that position. And the reason that this company was in that position was because they didn't recognize some of the icebergs uh, that are out there in healthcare. And one of those icebergs is unfortunately that the governments and insurance companies are essentially criminals. They're not interested in their customers being healthy and getting, you know, the ultimate uh, outcomes that we all want for ourselves. And when you have a conflict of interest at that level, then you obviously have a huge problem. And what I also realize is that medical professionals are not taught any business skills. So they, know, they have no idea how to build an infrastructure. And that's why they have to lean on insurance companies and governments to pay them because they don't know how to earn their own paycheck. So I had to solve that issue is building infrastructure, uh, building practitioners with the right mindset who value their worth, you know, because you have practitioners who are in this government and insurance model of healthcare that are getting peanuts for the work that they're doing, you know? And there's other healthcare professionals like a massage therapist makes more money an hour than a medical doctor does in many instances because of all the overhead that's involved in running a practice. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're doing good work, you should make lots of money. But, you know, it's not fair when somebody spends, you know, 
10 years in school get like, the best years of their life and can barely make ends meet because they're being exploited by, you know, by the insurance company. So as a practice coach, you know, I had to learn all this stuff on my own and I built an entire system that addresses these core needs. You know, how do we get practitioners to understand their self-worth? How do we pair these practitioners with patients who are going to be compliant so they get results because a non-compliant patient doesn't get results and a non-compliant patient who doesn't get results never refers people. So you have to have this constant marketing mill taking place. And I eliminated marketing for doctors because doctors don't like to market. The word doctor actually means teacher. What they love to do is educate. Now, if you can turn that education into a indoctrination process where then it's the patient's choice to see you instead of your choice for the patient to see you, then you have this amazing energy and exchange that takes place because you're providing tremendous amounts of value and the patient is seeking you and seeking your guidance and they're going to be compliant because they value what you're bringing to the table. And when a patient is paying for the care, they're going to be even more compliant because they're going to show up at every appointment having done their homework. So we tried to solve this, this issue um, and, and also provide a platform where practitioners can, you know, get their message out there to have the business systems in place so that when people come in, they know how to handle it. So they run a streamlined, efficient business. So it significantly uh, lowers their overhead. There's very little capital cost when starting a functional medicine practice, unlike a dental office or a medical office, or even a chiropractic office where you have 30 to $50,000 of capital costs just to start your practice and open your doors. Functional medicine essentially has zero capital costs involved because you outsource the testing and then all you need is a desk and a brain, right? So, uh, so we essentially perfected what we call the micro practice where practitioners can go from having this huge, massive $30,000 per month overhead and all this staff and all this insurance billing and all this other unnecessary cost and go into a cash-based practice where they have an extremely low level of overhead, which significantly lowers the stress that they're under. They can, they can charge a reasonable rate that people can afford because their overhead is much lower and they can spend more time with their family. So I disc- that was my goal is I wanted to get paid a professional fee. I wanted to have low overhead and low stress. I wanted to have systems in place so that uh, so I, I could minimize the amount of staff that I had because, you know, it's staffing means managing personalities and that can become very taxing and mentally it can be expensive as well. So we created a system that solves all of these issues for people. And as a result of that, we've been able to scale our practice. And now I teach this to other practitioners because what I'm starting to realize is we're going to need tens of thousands of practices like this. And one way to get people to switch from their traditional medical model is to provide them with a system that works and a system that's profitable and a system that lowers their stress and overhead and allows them to spend more time with their family because that's why people make money. They, they make money so they, don't, they can work less, right? That's the irony of it. And mm. if you have to work more to make more money, then you're, you're not with your family doing the things that you're passionate about outside of your work. Of course, you should be passionate about the work that you do, but I'm way more passionate about spending time with my family uh, than seeing patients. And I say that with pride because that's how all of us should be. We should all want to spend more time with our families than being at work. Yes. So where can practitioners get more information about your programs? Uh, They can go to functionalmedicineconsultant.com. We're also doing, we also do webinars and they can also speak to a practice development coach. So they can go to uh, lpischedule.com and speak to Tibby, who's one of my practice development coaches, and they can learn more about what we have to offer um, if they feel like they're a good fit or if they're a functional medicine practitioner looking to you know, scale, their, scale their practice, scale their business, and, and implement systems. Perfect. Perfect. And if you are, so if you're a practitioner, I'll provide the links below. And if you are just listening because you want those healthy tips. You want to learn how to feel better, have more energy, sleep better, think clear, lose weight. Then do yourself a favor and go to 30in30.org and sign up and start implementing those nutrition, health, and lifestyle tips. Um, I promise you, you, uh, you won't regret it. Sachin, thank you so much for your time. Um, I have an min- immense amount of respect and appreciation for what you're doing. You're obviously on a mission. Um, if, if you guys aren't following Sachin on social media, uh, make sure to check him out again. I'll provide the link below. Um, so much wisdom. Uh, so your, your time's very much appreciated. And, 
and uh, don't hesitate to let me know if there's anything I can do to support you further. Well, this has been very enlightening and you're very supportive by even just having me on here. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone watching. I hope that you gain some value and there's tons of value that we, um, that we offer in the 30 and 30 program. And then follow me on social media because <clears throat> one of the things I tell people who are looking for a mentor is you don't want to find a mentor that is just good at business. You want to find a mentor that's good at life because there's lots of people that make tons of money, but their relationships suck. They barely see their kids. They barely go on vacation. And so if you're ever hiring a mentor, whether it's me or somebody else is irrelevant, but if you're ever hiring someone, look at their entire landscape of their life, not just what their bank account says, because there's more to life than making money. I think that, you know, I want to make that very clear that, you know, when you're um, making money, I think it's important that you, you know, obviously put food on your table. I think it's important that you pay it forward, but there's many currencies to life, not just the currency of cash and, and uh, what's in your bank account. And the other thing too is in, on social media is where I, I share, I, you know, I share a lot of inspirational thoughts. I make people think, which I think we need to do more of. And I give you, you know, food for thought, if you will. But I, I share insights, personal insights into my personal life. But also you get to see, you know, little video clips of my son and my family. And, and you get to see the whole picture. So I encourage all of you to follow me. I, I have 5,000 friends, so you can't add me as a friend anymore. Uh, so don't do that because I can't add you back but follow me on Facebook and I'd love to connect with you there and, and message me if you have any questions or, you know, if there's anything you're unsure of, then by all means, I'm, I'm pretty responsive. So you can, you can uh, send me some questions on social media as well. Well, it's just like you said, the best thing that we can do both as parents and practitioners is to lead by example. And you are obviously living proof of, of that example. And, um, and so I'm looking forward for uh, big things to come and uh, again, thank you very much for your time. And I will talk to you soon, brother. Thanks, brother. I love you. Thank you very Take much. Take care. Bye. Bye.